Um, you know, Steve Ballmer was on the board at least for a little while. Gates was still on the board. Here are two, the, the only two former CEOs of the company. Generally, a new CEO wants to get those guys as far away as possible. How has that worked out? It's worked out fantastic. I mean, you, you got to remember, I'm a consummate insider. I've grown up at Microsoft for 25 years. I'm a product of the company uh, that Paul and Bill founded and Steve and Bill created. Uh, and so I'm very proud of our heritage. Uh, definitely, I'm also a keen observer of things that we've got right, the things that we got wrong. Uh, but that said, Bill's influence is tremendous in the company. I mean, he's the founder. Uh, his ability to convene uh, anything in Microsoft and anybody at Microsoft and ensure that we are at the top of our game uh, is unparalleled. Uh, and so I wanted that. I wanted to make sure uh, that we were able to invoke uh, that, I would say, that intellectual honesty that is so amazing in him. Uh, so that he can show us the mirror each day and say, hey, are you better than yesterday? <laughs> and that's only uniquely Bill, and I wanted to make sure that that continued. You managed to point out a number of things in the book that you learned from Steve Ballmer, of course from Bill Gates as well, and it strikes me that you're at once paying homage to the things they got right and the things that you learned from them, while at the same time, this is about hitting refresh in a culture that needed to change. <laughs> Where did you learn that kind of depth diplomacy? Because um, on the one hand, you're saying, here are some things they got absolutely right, and here are some things that went off track along the way. I mean, quite honestly, the confidence to even do that, uh, I think, comes from, in fact, observing them. Uh, like even, for example, Steve's last piece of advice to me was, hey, don't try to be like me. Don't try to be like Bill. Be yourself. <laughs> be bold. Be right. That was his advice to me. But. I think that ability to know what you can learn, whether it's from Steve or Bill or many other leaders at Microsoft, or Jeff Rakes or Doug Burgum or, and so on, I feel that the, the leaders at Microsoft were true mentors who didn't mean to teach us that, hey, only followership of me and what I've done is what's leadership. It's about you being able to follow your own path. And uh, he is a smooth operator, Josh Lipton. Uh, he's a guy not easily thrown off. He's been through a lot in his life. I mean, coming in, I don't know if you remember this, coming in, he stuck his foot in his mouth at the Grace Hopper conference talking about women asking for raises. So he and I also talked about that. I want to play uh, another clip here where I ask him just about, does anything throw him off? <laughs> Do you ever freak out? Do you ever just slap your head and look at the ceiling and go, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Or, or have the pressures that life has put, brought to bear on you over the years just brought you uh, to the point where you don't have that issue? I, I imagine that might have been one of those times. It's early in your tenure and boom. No, I mean, I think, you know, the way I look at it is that it's, the pressure is on every day, right? <laughs> because in some sense, that's what's exciting to me right, uh, hmm. about these jobs, which is, uh, what I've at least learned is I'm not perfect, uh, but one thing that I'm open to and I want to be open to is learning from my mistakes. Uh, that second part is what helps. Uh, in fact, one of the cultural memes we talk a lot about uh, is this growth mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of growth mindset is to, in some sense, confront your fixed mindset. Uh, it's not to say, oh, I'm great, uh, I've got this ability to continuously grow. You only, it's the opposite, right? It's exactly the opposite. <laughs> you have to, in fact, every day admit to yourself all the places where you could have done better. Uh, and the more successful you are at it, the, better the chances are that you will be able to do, really improve. You also talk about what you've learned as a father from the experiences of your kids. Um, your son, Zane, has had challenges with cerebral palsy, and it taught you empathy. You say when you had your entrance interview into Microsoft, there was an empathy question that you flunked. The question was something like, uh, you're walking down the street, you see a crying baby in the street, what do you do? And your answer was call 911. That's correct. <laughs> you know, but that's, it, one of the things I've learned is, it's not just about, oh, you're born empathetic. If anything, I think life's experiences help you gain more insight and more deeper empathy for more people. In fact, if anything, that's what happens. Um, and so the question is, how are you using those moments? You know, that interview question clearly made me think. I mean, I was 25 years old. 
Uh, I had not, you know, I was not even married at that point, so I didn't have that empathy for what does one actually do when a child is crying on the road. You actually hug them, or you don't try and look for a phone. <laughs> uh, same thing with Zayn. In fact, I must say I learned from my wife what came more, so much more naturally to her when Zayn was born, which is to care for him. Uh, is something that it took me a while because it was more about like I was first about why did this happen to us and me naturally uh, and then a few years went by and then I realized nothing happened to me something happened to Zayn what's my responsibility as a father uh, and I think that was perhaps one of the you know the big hit refresh moments when I look back for me personally that has influenced uh, and so I think it's our life's experience that then leads into work and work's experience that leads into life. And it's one of those things where uh, it has to be lived. It can't be taught. Josh Lipton, your impressions of, I mean, th there are a lot of books out there that have been written by CEOs, about CEOs. I know you haven't read Hit Refresh yet. Um, it was my job to read it and, and talk to him about it, but you'll, you'll get to it. I'm sure it's, it's high on your list. Your impressions of Satya Nadella in kind of the group right now of, of tech CEOs, his personality, his, his approach to things. He is unbelievably, as, as you saw there, he um, is unbelievably calm and cool and collected. Um, I don't think you can throw Satch off too easily, as, as you mentioned. Um, I'm struck by, so I've never had the opportunity, John, to um, interview Satya. I did have the interview to the opportunity to interview Steve Bomber. And I remember <laughs> um, I interviewed Bomber when he bought the Clippers um, and you know flew down to LA. And, and, and obviously, um, Satya's predecessor, very different kind of personality. I mean, even in that interview, um, Bomber is all passion. It's all on his sleeve. Um, you know, he came in for a lot of criticism um, that I remember talking about with him, you know, and you heard those criticisms and you know those, John, um, that he missed social and mobile and cloud and I think some of them maybe not as fair as others. But um, Satya has a very different demeanor, obviously extremely well respected. Um, you know, you've known him for a long time, built Microsoft into a serious big cloud contender. Um, and I was I was struck in the in the interview by how personal he was willing to be and um, how open he was as well um, in talking about you know the challenges in his home life with his kids and how those have sort of influenced his worldview. I thought it was a great interview. Uh, w one more I, I want to show, and this is about Satya Nadella's immigrant experience. Uh, he, he shared some details in this book and as part of our conversation, I had just never heard before. One more time, here's Satya Nadella. In the book, you talk about your own experience uh, coming to the U.S. as a 21-year-old, uh, being on this college campus, and then going to work for Microsoft. And in it, you talk also about how you transitioned from being this lone worker to getting married and, and being a family man. And you had a green card. This I didn't realize uh, about you. I'm going to read just a portion uh, from it. You had a green card and you say you're, you're looking to get married to your wife. The H-1B enables spouses to come to the United States while their husbands and wives are working here. Such is the perverse logic of this immigration law. There was nothing I can do about it. Anu, your wife-to-be, was my top, was my priority. And that made my decision a simple one. I went back to the U.S. Embassy in Delhi in June of 1994, passed the enormous lines of people hoping to get a visa, and told the clerk that I wanted to give back my green card and apply for an H-1B. He was dumbfounded. You gave up your green card because U.S. immigration law at the time said your wife would probably have to wait five years at least to come over. How does that inform the way you as the CEO of Microsoft look at this immigration debate that's happening in our country right now? The first thing I would say, John, I'm a product of two amazing, unique American things. American technology that reached me where I was growing up helped me dream the dream, and then the enlightened American immigration policy that let me come here and live the dream. So when I think about it, only in America would a story like mine be even possible. So before we are critical about our immigration policy, the fact that the U.S. is the beacon of hope and the attractor of talent from all over the world is something that we should hold as precious. That's where the criticism comes from, mm -hmm. not in terms of uh, anything else. Having said that, I think we can have an immigration policy that is enlightened, which is for our own competitiveness, right? It's not about uh, doing this out of anything else other than to say, let us be the place which attracts the best talent so that that best talent can come contribute to our economy. 
But it's not just about skilled immigration. We also need to stand up for being the last place of hope for, most pe for people who need it the most. That's what, again, drives America's uniqueness, and we should never, never give it up. Microsoft's immigration lawyer, or an immigration lawyer at Microsoft, was the one who suggested to you That's that maybe you needed to shift from a green card to an H-1B to do that. Not everybody has that kind of expert advice in place. And some would argue our immigration system hasn't been enlightened for a long time, if ever. So how do we get there? How does Microsoft help us get there? I mean, I think a, a comprehensive immigration reform uh, that, again, speaks to the our interests as a nation, what makes us stronger, what makes us more competitive, I think is much needed. Uh, some of the things, that the, the idea that you have to give up your green card to get an H-1B uh, is, in, in retrospect, silly. Um, and so, therefore, let us, in fact, take the reform uh, and so that it works for us, both our security, but as well as our competitiveness. Uh, for me, as far as how I look at various immigration issues, Josh, uh, as, as a tech reporter, as you are, I've been looking at H-1B uh, and H-1B abuse. We had that story from the, I believe it was the New York Times, uh, several months ago detailing how Disney had brought in some H-1B workers and had... Um, their workers train these workers from a contractor to replace them in their jobs. That's not right. But then, you know, I hear Satya Nadella's story. Here's a guy, clearly immensely talented, young guy, has a green card, but needs to get an H-1B in order to bring his wife to the United States, which, of course, should have been a thing that was possible without, you know, pulling these strings and, and tricks in the immigration system. What's your impression when you hear that story? I think it's, um, I mean, obviously it was a very personal story. Immigration broadly, John, we've talked about this, is a, certainly a hot-button topic out here. Um, you hear the stories of not just Sachin Nadella, but, of course, um, other executives, uh, Sundar Pichai over at Google. I think it also maybe shed some light into why Microsoft as a company, as an institution, has taken some of the strong stands it has when it comes to that topic, obviously, um, certainly on the forefront when it came to that debate about DACA and, and, and Dreamers. I yeah. think the interview and his own experience probably gives you some more insight about why they feel as a company, not just from a business perspective, but a personal uh, perspective on the part of their executives, why they took the line that, that they did in that debate. He and I had a conversation that was split. Half of it was live on CNBC yesterday uh, in Squawk Alley. So I encourage you, you can go back, check that out on CNBC.com. But half of it was not uh, aired. You heard maybe a little piece of it there and the chunk that I played for you. You're going to be able to hear the whole conversation starting this weekend on the Fort Knox podcast. Fortnox.com or Fortnox.com slash Apple if you're uh, an, an Apple podcasts person will get you there. Go ahead and subscribe. I guarantee you don't want to miss it. It's about a 25 minute, half hour conversation. We touch on uh, more of what he learned from his experience with dealing with his kids who had some unique challenges, his immigrant experience, uh, what he learned from his mom who left her career in order to, to help raise him. Um, Definitely one of my favorite conversations thus far on the Fort Knox podcast. So, Josh Lipton, there's more going on in tech, of course, than Satya Nadella's new book. One of the things going on is this spat between Amazon and Google that just cropped up today. Amazon's got the Amazon Echo Show, one of many Echoes. The Echo Show has a screen, and it's supposed to maybe sit in the kitchen. You can watch a little video um, of food preparation, maybe for a recipe you're making, talk to your family while they're painting a mural. Who does that? How often does that happen? I don't know. But in any case, one of the main uses of this thing, you imagine for most people, is going to be watching YouTube videos, but there's a spat. Google has pulled YouTube videos saying that Amazon was implementing this wrong. Josh, what does this tell us about this video device era? Uh, so my immediate impression was, I mean, we don't know, um, obviously, how many people uh, would be would be upset by this because the show, the, the, this product is a, a relatively new device. I think it only uh, recently started going on sale. Maybe it was June, I think. So, yeah. But, I mean, I certainly think... Um, if you bought this device, in part you were you're doing so because you were excited. Um, I would think about you know full disclosure. I don't I don't own the device, but I would think it was about the video content. And now Jeff Bezos is thinking, well, wait a minute. Um, 
I'm not going to be able to show YouTube content. And people love their YouTube. I mean, YouTube has now 1.5 billion monthly viewers, and people engage with it really aggressively. I mean, I think they get something like it's an average of 60 minutes a day now watching YouTube for those folks on their mobile devices, their phones and tablets. Um, so, I, But I would say, obviously, listen, you see these spats. Um, it'll be interesting how it plays out, John, yeah. because sometimes you have these fights but you think you know, at, you know, Amazon and Apple. That was another <laughs> another fight, right? No Apple TV. Apparently, that's now uh, been resolved. Partially. Amazon, I'm reading, is now partially relisting partially. Um, the Apple TV. So um, you'll see how it plays out. Uh, you know, from part here. of what I think this might be about is part of what Amazon's doing with Alexa and the Echo is search. It's it's getting all up in Google's space. All up all up in its court and dunking on Google when it comes to voice search. And I wonder, when you talk to your Amazon Echo show and you say, Alexa, show me a video about blah, 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 whatever it is, how much data does Google and YouTube get about exactly what kind of search query that was, where geographically the person launched that query from? I mean, because that's all stuff. If you're a YouTube creator, you know, you get all that information analytics-wise about where the search came from, all that, and YouTube use that, uses that to target ads. If, if Amazon's trying to withhold any bit of that information and how it's getting input, I can imagine that could be a problem. Yeah, I mean, listen, these two are, um, are crossing into a, a lot of different markets with each other. I think at the end of the day, unfortunately, it's probably, and other tech analysts have been pointing this out today too, I mean, part of the issue too is it's really the user who suffers for this. If you bought that product, you're probably pretty disappointed. Again, I, I would be surprised though if that fight drags on, if they didn't reach some mutual accommodation there going forward, John. Another thing about this, one of the things I talked to Satya Nadella about, again, you'll, you'll hear it um, if you watch the CNBC live portion or check out the podcast over the weekend, this collaboration that he and Microsoft have with Amazon and Jeff Bezos, you know, Cortana is Microsoft's voice agent, Alexa is Amazon's voice agent. They're doing this thing where if you're talking to Cortana, you can say, Cortana, ask Alexa the price of avocados at Whole Foods. And then if you're talking to Alexa, you can say, Alexa, ask Cortana what my next meeting is in my Outlook calendar. Now, despite the fact that yeah. that's hugely annoying, because you got to remember what Alexa knows and what Cortana knows, and you got to be a go-between. It's like bad family communication. It's like a dysfunctional, mm. ask your mother what. But despite that, they're collaborating. Maybe there's a reason why Google and Amazon aren't incentivized to communicate where Microsoft and Amazon are. Tea leaves, Josh. Well, we, yeah, we've talked about that before. I mean, I, that was, um, you know, I think we talked about this before. And that was the way those digital assistants, those virtual assistants were communicating did seem to bring up a lot of friction. Um, it didn't seem to be um, so such an easy user experience. But I do remember, you know, some of the, some tech analysts I was talking to um, were making the case that the reason that partnership makes sense is because, you know, those, those two aren't phone guys, right? They don't exactly. have phones. Exactly, that's so what I'm the, getting that, at, that, right? Yeah, that partnership then probably makes strategically more sense, some analysts were, are, would, would imply. Um, I remember talking to Rob Enderly about that, and that was exactly his point when that partnership was announced. For them, it makes sense. Um, for the others, not so much. And, you know, they don't have phones, and I wonder to what degree the data about the search itself is going to become a battleground. Is this, is this about the way uh, Amazon built the browser in the Echo Show and, and whether YouTube is able to show next video and keep people engaged? It could be about that. Or is it also about the amount of data that Amazon is or isn't giving to Google about where the person's searching from, what they're searching for? I don't know. Of course, we'll continue to dig into this and try to find out. Uh, today, we found out that Twitter is changing the tweet, Josh. 140 characters, no more, at least for certain users yes. right now. It's up to 280 characters. That's, yeah. a, that's not a lot of characters. But for the Twitter faithful, it's a, this is a revolution. Um, people are up and no, I, Yeah. You know, so I, 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 so I broke that news last night. It crossed 
um, during Fast Money, and um, we talked about that. Um, Melissa Lee on her show talked about it. It's interesting because 140 characters, I'm obviously, a lot of people are going to be used to that. That's a defining feature of Twitter. I'm actually a fan of the 140 because I think it forces people to be maybe hopefully a little more succinct, um, and I appreciate that, John, and maybe it's because... Like yourself, I got my start in print, and um, <laughs> Headline I writing. remember being, I remember being at Forbes uh, back in the day, and and I had great editors there, Matt Schifrin and John Dobos and, and Mitch Martin, and and that was a big thing at Forbes, as you know, wow. as I'm sure it was Forbes where you were at. That's you're like a hip hop yeah, artist, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, well, those anybody, guys deserve yeah. it. <laughs> those guys deserve it. I mean, they always used to say, you know, listen, if you brought them copy, they would say that's that's great. Now I want it in about half the half the page. Um, so I, I like 140. I kind of agree with some of the critics who say 140 just feels um, more glanceable than 280. Um, you know, but I could be wrong. Maybe people, maybe people, that's expanding this character limit is gonna is just gonna create much more of a, a friendly user experience. You know, and, and, yeah. and increase engagement in users. Here's my thing. Why not 560? Right? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna go 140 to 280. Why, why not? You know, then then why why not uh, the 1120? You know, it, the, the thing is, okay, the, the tweet is. I've run out of space in the tweet a lot, and Twitter has this whole explanation about how you know English speakers, English writers, run out of space more often than people who are tweeting in Japanese because they can express more with fewer characters. Efficient, very nice, mm. but why not just blow the whole thing up then? To me. It's really effective if tweets are like footnotes, right? If I've written something longer and I'm sending a tweet out to get people to it, you know, why not allow me? I mean, Medium was started by Ev Williams, who, who also was a founder of Twitter. Why didn't they just buy Medium and wrap the two together so that I can, I can write a Medium post, you know, highlight part of it, that gets turned into a tweet, pulls people into the Medium post, they can mark it up, tweet out pieces of it, people can like and comment and retweet. Like, that would sort of deal to me, for me, with this tweet length issue without turning it into what's the ideal length of a tweet. I'm not sure 280 is that much better. Yeah. Is twice. And maybe as good. just maybe in general, John. Maybe I mean maybe the character issue isn't really. You know that would be uh, the criticism that, it's a character that the, issue. Char the length of the, the length of character. <laughs> right. yeah, it's Jack Dorsey's character issue. It's it's maybe the you know that that's not really the big bold step. Some would argue that Twitter has to make um, to increase users' engagement. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, the the big question is what can the president do with 280 mm. characters? Yes, we are waiting. Bated breath. <laughs> what does bated breath smell like? I, I've always wondered that because it's not it's not b a i t. It's b a t e. So what is that? Is it is it fishy? Is it not fishy? Mm. Is it? Let me ask my camera operator, Heidi, what does bated breath smell like to you? Um, like fear and stress? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Fear and stress. It smells like you anticipation. Know, that's not what they want on Twitter. They, they do not want that. Um, right now, right now, uh, Amazon is having an event. Breaking news, Josh. Breaking news. They have announced a new Fire TV player. They've announced mm. an Echo Plus device with a better sound system. And it also acts as a smart home hub. Part of what's happening here, I mean, clearly we saw a new Apple TV that had 4K built in. Um, yep. we, we know that a Apple is coming out with their smart speaker, of course, behind Amazon. But this Echo Plus, we've got like a whole family of Echoes at, at this point. The, the sound system in this seems to compete more directly with what Apple is trying to do uh, with, with its music device that we expect to see Siri controlled coming out for this holiday season too, right? Yeah, and I'm, I'm reading, I'm just um, catching up with you, John. It looks like reportedly the, the Echo smart speakers, so they're also going to make phone calls, which is interesting because that obviously, um, you know, when I was at the Google developer show um, a few months back, that was um, obviously something they added to their, their home speaker. Um, so more Amazon, Google going at it over those devices. I think you weren't you always, John, kind of um, 
a, a pretty instant critic of the whole idea of the, the home speaker yeah. a, as a device to make calls. I, yeah. I, I seem to remember you not really buying into the landline theme. Or am, I, or am I misremembering that? No, no, you're remembering it right. I am, I am an, a crotchety old man when it comes to these in-home intelligent speakers. I don't like the idea of an open mic in my house, not necessarily because it's a big problem now, but because once you, you've brought an open mic into your house, it's there. You sort of forget about it. And if it becomes a problem, what, are you going to shut them all down? Are you going to remember to do that? Are you going to think about kind now, of do you have one? Now, or, no. Now, do you, have a, do you have that device in your house? I don't or no? I don't have. You a, don't have any. Yeah. I don't have an Amazon Echo. I don't have a Google Home. Um, you know, yeah, I'm, I don't I'm in trouble if my wife decides she wants one because, you know. And, and Heidi, the camera operator, doesn't have one either. Is that a problem, John, that two tech correspondents don't have these devices in their living rooms? No, I no, I don't think it is. No. I don't, That's not an issue? You know, okay. I, don't, you know yeah. I, I don't click links on phishing emails either. Wait, why, I mean, why, Heidi, why, Heidi, do you not want one in your home? Privacy? Heidi yeah. doesn't even want to show it's her a privacy face. issue. Heidi doesn't even want to show uh, yeah, her face well, on, on Fortnite. Hey, She's staying behind the camera. Listen. So. Yeah, well, she, she has to talk to her agent, John, as you well know. Um, but yeah, I think um, Wait, Heidi's bringing up privacy the... issues, and those are. Yeah, is that it? Yeah, this is, is that, a, that's not the, the toaster oven. My eye went directly to the toaster oven, and I thought, that new Amazon Echo looks a lot like a toaster oven. I wonder why they're doing this. But <laughs> right, no, right. in front of the, squint, in front of the toaster oven, let's put that back up. In front of the toaster oven, there is a sleek looking gray device. I believe that, not the cutting board, look to the, to the side of the cutting board. That is our new Amazon Echo Plus, or I should say your new Amazon Echo Plus, because I don't want it in my house. But that's because I'm a crotchety no. old man when it comes now, to now, open Now, let me ask you: Are you are you you're, you're, are you interested in John um, Apple's new smart speaker coming in December? Does that pique your interest? Nah, well, nah. And the reason why not is I'm yeah. not a, I'm not a huge Apple Music fan. Just the the service mm. itself, I'm, it, it hasn't really completely won me over. I, I'm using Pandora a little bit. I've got uh, Amazon that I use for music too. It, I'm not sure I want to commit to the Apple ecosystem. Because once, once you get that HomePod, you've got to be all in with Apple and Apple Music. And uh, I feel like they're trying to get me, Josh. And they, they got me on a yeah. few fronts. You know, I'll use your laptop, Tim Cook, you know, because, because I'm enjoying the opera. I'll use your phone, but you're not going to get me everywhere. <laughs> It's good to see you holding the line, John. It's good to see you holding the line. <laughs> Nadell is helping me. He came in here. Yeah. You know, we had a little coaching, counseling session. I was telling him about, you know, features that I'd like to see in, in OneDrive and OneNote. You know, um, always got to try to keep him honest, Josh Lipton. <laughs> I wish I had. I love the idea of you geeking out with Satya Nadell, too, offering a sort of product, product reviews and enhancement, John. Well, once, I mean, how many people, how many people get to pitch Nadella? On, on the features I, they would like to see. I feel updated. bad. Once I angry tweeted him because OneDrive was down, which doesn't happen that often, but it, it, it happened. It, OneDrive was down, and I sort of angry tweeted because my wife was in the middle of creating a document and it went down on her, and she asked me what to do. And I was like, I don't know. So I sent out a tweet, and he responds. And so, you know, we're DMing back and forth, and now every time yeah. I see Satya Nadella, he's like, service. how's your wife enjoying OneDrive? And I feel bad. Man, that is You know, is that service. I was like, hey, yeah. Microsoft, hey, Satya, you need to get this taken care of, because now he's following up with me all the time. Josh Lipton, hey, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's 2.30 already, just about. I mean, how do did, how did we, how did we get here? Um, but a, a lot of news for people to watch. We covered, of course, that interview with Satya Nadella. Check it out, the full thing on the podcast over the weekend. That will go up, fortnox.com. Also, this latest news with Amazon, uh, Amazon versus Google, and long tweets. Weigh in on that. You've got, you've got twice as much space to weigh in if you're weighing in on Twitter. This